The next item on the agenda is ordinance number 2021-04014 ordinance amending city code chapter two, section two five electronic virtual public meetings for the public input during virtual meetings. Carol. Thank you. Um, we uh, received recently an opinion from the public access counselor that in um, there was there was a um, a few appeals of the implementation of the public input rules at um, meetings on um, November. Uh, let's see, November sixteenth, and I believe a November 9th meeting. And the opinion of the um, of the public access counselor was that the um, city had violated the Open Meetings Act in the implementation of the public input rules. And so I'll just want to read um, at the at the end uh, the sort of summation from the um, the pack um, in accordance with the conclusions of this letter. This office requests that the council instruct its presiding officers to refrain at its future meetings from applying its public comment rules, imposing content based restrictions to comments that do not disrupt its meetings or impede the council from conducting orderly meetings. And it goes on to say the public access counselor has determined that resolution of this matter does not require the issuance of a binding opinion. So um, even, even when we get a non-binding opinion from the, from the PAC, you know, we do take it seriously, and even though it's advisory. So uh, what, we've, what we've endeavored to do with the um, ordinance changes that are, that are before you is to um, remove any reference to language whatsoever from um, section um, 2.5, which deals with the um, electronic virtual public meetings so that no one has, there's no misconceptions about what may be restricted. It has to be manner um, only, and it has to be any behavior or provocation of disruptive behavior. So, um, which is what the, what the PAC sort of focused on, um, comments that do not disrupt its meetings or impede the council from conducting orderly meetings. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish with, with these changes. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about it. All right, questions for Carol. I believe the uh, Dave is also on the call. Yes, if you have any questions, legal questions. Dennis. Yes. Um, okay. So this is, uh, you know, a useful, a useful uh, experience to kind of fine tune what we're doing uh, during the Zoom conferencing. Um, certainly, when we started out, we were trying out um, something that was new to us as well, and uh, our, we didn't make it exactly perfectly through that experience. Um, so now we're like coming back and fixing something that uh, we've been pointed out. We're specifically that we didn't do well, so we're gonna to try to fix that. Um, so the, uh, the uh, problem for uh, us wasn't the fact that, we, that individuals were speaking in a way what we thought might be disrespectful. The problem that the uh, counselor wants us to look at is the fact that it's disruptive. So um, I was sort of just sort of wondering, um, since we're not meeting in a face-to-face uh, -face in the city council chamber, um, when what what really breaches um, a Zoom meeting where it becomes um, disruptive? If whatever is said in the four minutes given and allotted to the individual is no longer constrained by, by a comment or word, then what is disruptive can only become, and what they seem to point out was that uh, when a person is uh, very agitated and perhaps is yelling or something during the meeting, it was pointed out that the individuals who were making the complaint were speaking in a modulated tone of voice, even though necessarily the content was displeasing to individuals because nobody ever likes to be singled out and berated during a public meeting. 
but I guess the open, I guess the First Amendment allows whatever disagreement of a conversation needs to take place. It's not gonna be possible for people to, to end up in fisticuffs during a Zoom meeting. So uh, do we have guidance about what it, what it takes to be disruptive other than talking longer than is allotted to you so that you're holding up the process of the meeting? Well, I mean, something can be disruptive if, for instance, a person chooses to yell. Um, that yes. th That is a manner. It's not what they're saying. It's the manner in which they're saying it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what other kinds of things, but yelling is something that comes to mind for me. Um, Dave, I don't know if you have any things. And, and, and what about um, if an individual resorts to a swear, a swear word or something? Is that considered disruptive or is that just poor, poor pop? poor manners? Um, again, I, I, I don't know. I, I suppose it might be that um, it might be that if, if, if one word is a swear word versus a string of swear words because they're really interested in swearing and not communicating, um, <laughs> okay. that could be manner also because they're not really communicating something of substance. Um, Dave, did you want to weigh in on this at all or? Since I'm not a lawyer, I'm just kind of winging it. No, that's okay. You're doing a good job, I think, in terms of explanations. And so, um, you know, what I'll share is you kind of hone in on exactly the question. Um, what I'll point out is that the PAC opinion didn't suggest that the rules that are currently in place were really a problem. It was more in their application. And I, as you pointed out, you know, the, the biggest thing that they discussed was that the comments were done in kind of a calm fashion. Uh, so as Administrator Mitten pointed out, I think if you ran into a string of vulgarities or somebody's yelling and, uh, you know, basically into the screen, um, I do think that that would be, you know, a, a situation where you could enact these rules and, and potentially mute them. My, my general sense of this is just that if you look at the history in terms of attorney general opinions and case law, they all relate to in-person meetings. And so it, it's easy to make decisions when you're in person because, you know, most of what you see in those opinions and cases is it's some behavior coupled with the comments. And so, you know, the, the focus becomes more on that behavior. They may mention the nature of the comments because it goes into the idea of how agitated the person may be. And when you're in person, it's a lot easier to talk about the idea of a disruption because you're all in person and, and it depends on how people are reacting to this and that behavior um, to be able to do that. I think, <laughs> It's just, in, in my opinion, these concepts have not caught up with the idea of remote meetings um, because, you know, in, in my sense there, I think there are things, even though you're not in person and create that kind of issue, uh, there would be scenarios that rise to a level of, look, you know, we need to kind of deal with this individual and how they're uh, presenting themselves during a meeting to be able to react and, and use these rules in that sense. And so uh, it can be difficult to decide, you know, is there a bar that could be set on the idea of when you're looking at really just the words that are being said versus just kind of standing on your time limit. Um, you know, a lot of focus on these things is really driven to the time limit because in, in remote, it's easy. You just have to withstand the four minute barrage potentially. And then, you know, when they hit their limits, you uh, cut them off. And as long as you're consistent, there's no issues there. You know, that's kind of somewhat the answer in this remote meeting world. So I hope that helped. I can certainly uh, continue or answer any questions that you may have. Well, I know that in the Roberts Rules of Order, I, I looked at that, uh, I don't know, a month ago or so. And uh, there is a procedure that the, uh, if an individual is um, shouting and um, libeling, I think even uh, a member of the board that they're addressing, um, that the, uh, the charge, sorry, they have a sergeant at arms at a meeting, uh, that person is escorted out, but I think they have to be called out first and then and then they're re removed from the room. So there is a process even, you know, in open meetings of removing people from a procedure with their being disruptive. But what, what amounts to being disruptive is, uh, like I think I, you said, it's for the most part in our meetings, even though uh, it's hard to hear some of the words and the incivility that is even perhaps in a tone of voice or a condescending tone of voice, um, unless they go past the time limit for their 
their public comment, there's not that much we can do about it. Those right. are my thoughts. All right, other questions? Um, I did have one question for Dave. Um, so I, I'm thinking, you know, as you said, that we haven't caught up with the virtual meeting world. And of course, one of the things that happens in the virtual meetings is that there are bugs that are found in, in different applications and so forth. And so given the updates of these rules, if, um, if there is some kind of nudity that is shown, which would mean that they would have the ability to show their camera, are you able to um, basically kick them out or tell them to turn their camera off? Did, do our rules allow for that? Um, you know, I think what you could do is think in terms of the language that's used in terms of behavior and conduct where it talks about disorderly conduct. Now, I will say, you know, obviously, as I've participated in these meetings is that I've never seen a commenter's video on. It's really just them speaking. Um, and so I don't know if that really is something that the council has done in the past or even would allow for, because if the answer is no, where well, you're never going to see a video you know, I suppose the question may be moot, but what I would suggest is if for some reason that were the case, uh, you know, the concept of disorderly conduct is fairly broad in, in a sense, uh, you know, as far as what could be covered. And always, I always think about this in terms of how a police officer would issue a citation for disorderly conduct. Um, and it is basically the alarming, disturbing uh, kind of concept. And so, you know, that it, it's that scenario, I think, would fall into that category. And so I think your rules could account for that concept uh, if that were to occur. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Carol or Dave? All right. Uh, can I have a motion? I guess I'll make that. Okay, I, uh, this is concerning ordinance number 2021-04-014, an ordinance amending the city code chapter two, section 2.5, concerning electronic virtual public meeting, uh, public input during virtual meetings or Zoom meetings. I recommend that we accept the, the uh, drafted ordinance into our uh, process of uh, procedure and forward this to the city council with recommendation of approval. I'll, I'll second. second it. All right, moved by Dennis, seconded by Bill Brown. Uh, does this, do we wanna put this on the consent agenda? Um, I didn't recommend it. I, it's, it's a touchy process. It's a, it's a sort of a touchy topic. I think we should we can keep it on the regular agenda. Yeah, just, you know, we, I think we support it, but um, let's just not make it a rubber stampish experience. All right, Jared. Uh, I mean, I'm glad to see that uh, this change is coming. You know, I, we had a lot of discussion about this when it initially came up and I was the sole person who told all of you all that we couldn't do this. And it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna fly, and nobody listened to me. <laughs> it took a pack opinion to what a lot of people were saying. I mean, I guess I wasn't the only person. We were getting a ton of public input about people who felt the same way. And I don't know. It just, I, 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 I I'm, I'm interested to hear from, except for Eric, because Eric wasn't on on council, so he couldn't vote for couldn't have voted for it uh, from the rest of you guys. Now that you've seen this, like how you feel about the fact that we did this in the first place, like what were, what convinced you guys the first go around that this was, this was going to fly. That's what I'm curious. I, I'm just, everybody's read the pack opinion. I think it spells it out pretty well. I thought I made a lot of the same arguments when we were discussing it. I'm just curious if anybody has, has, your, your guys' thoughts on why, I don't know. Sure, I'll do it. So I think that we were learning about uh, public input and of course we had uh, the Elia Lewis case before us. And so there was a lot of anger expressed in the public comment, anger and frustration. And so uh, that borders on um, antagonism or, uh, or um, 
incivility. And I think we were trying to understand exactly where we stood uh, in receiving that kind of um, uh, uh, public input. And, uh, you know, people were, um, uh, were uh, complaining very strongly about individuals by name, our city staff. And uh, I, I think that's reasonable, but I think the tone in which the uh, disagreement was brought forward wasn't healthy for uh, civil, civil discussion in a city council meeting. And I think that it was after we actually did experience doing a few shutoffs that we found that the discourse from the public was moderated. So I think that we both benefited from the experience and I think we've learned about it. And I don't think that there's any shame in uh, changing the, the ordinance to accommodate the ruling of the council from the state uh, because, um, because we erred. We can accept the fact that we made a mistake and I think we all learned from it. And I think also that we've learned and seen that the public is actually uh, providing input to us that is not, not necessarily less vital or less um, felt, but they're doing it in a way that is much more acceptable and civil and which we appreciate very much. Uh, anybody else want to speak? So uh, Bill, would you take the, the chair for a second? This, this bill? Yeah, sorry, Bill Brown. Yeah, go ahead, Mary Alice. Um, just kind of to, to answer your question, Jared, I think um, I agreed Bill had brought up the fact that the proof in terms of whether or not this was going to be appropriate was how it was implemented. Um, and the, the my major concern was not that the elected officials were getting, uh, you know, attacked or whatever phrase you want to use. I think my concern was with the staff and the climate that the staff have to live in during these public meetings. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had thought a lot about this in terms of when I was committee chair, as I am today, in terms of what I would ask uh, public participants to do. And my personal take on this was I was going to ask public participants that they have a concern to direct it towards the uh, department that they are, are facing um, issues with. Um, but my plan was not to mute anybody, but was to recommend that they just direct it to the actual office that they're doing. So that's why I thought it was worthwhile to give it a try to see how it worked. Um, I did notice throughout the, the months that this has been in place that um, I don't think anybody was muted after November. Um, and yet we still received very harsh criticisms. Um, there were still people who were called out that were elected officials um, with very harsh criticisms and they weren't muted. So that, from my perspective, that's, that's how I was going to approach it. And that's why I originally voted for it. All right, I would take my seat. I'll relinquish the chair back. Thank you, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> there's no further discussion. Jared, did you want to say something? Uh Sure. I, I, I just, uh, that Diane, you don't have anything to say about this. You were, you were the one who led, uh, this whole charge about doing this. Diane is muted. Yeah, I figured as much. No, I have nothing more to say. Okay. All right. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Sachs? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Colebrook? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. All right, that moves forward to city council with a recommendation for approval. 